uh, over to uh, to Europe now for the base location to be in Gdansk in in Poland. So they managed to get um, an apartment to to keep there for a year's period of time, and um, I will be going. Uh, probably in two weeks, I will leave here and go over to Poland. And the mission over there will be to hold two or three retreats for uh, eight to 10 days for international coaches who are coaching people all over the world. And they want to use the tranquil wisdom insight meditation. They want to learn to teach people how to do the metta. So these will be intense retreats for uh, basically getting them to learn the basics and getting them to learn general coaching in cooperation with me. And they will go back to um, basically to the UK and to, I believe, Spain and France and Italy, and then uh, in the other direction, also to the Czech Republic and some other places. So we're really happy about being able to do this. And I'm happy to get away from the heat because the heat has been very, very hard on me. Uh, this year, it's been in the hundreds for almost like not just a few days, but more like a few weeks. And it's very, very hard on me at this age. So this is a plan to figure out how to continue working here. Uh, but at the same time, be able to leave for two or three months each year and not get stuck in the in the weather. So that's what's happening. Now, tonight, what we're going to do is I was, as I said, moved by the by the visa. I'm very interested to me what happens with that day, <clears throat> whether we are just talking about uh, the birth of the Buddha or the fact that he was enlightened or the fact that his, he, re, he left and died and was in Parinibbana, er, accomplished Parinibbana, where he wasn't going to come back anymore er, uh, at all. And what moves me the most is what he gave us. And so what I am talking about is Visak Day. And this is about the gift that he gave us. So I tried to think about how to present this to you. And um, I'm wondering if everybody here understands what he did, but he gave us freedom from suffering. If we were to follow his instructions, we are learning uh, a path that reach, eventually reaches Nibbana to have that experience to open the mind, but also is something else that's happening because he's teaching us an everyday practice of daily uh, relief from suffering and the practice that you're learning uh, is giving you an avenue for learning that practice for training your brain uh, to learn to practice in a way that you can do this all the time in every interaction with human beings whether it's at home or work or school it doesn't matter. The practices that he gave us were for relief. And this is what people are mostly interested in now, more than anything in Buddhism, is they want to know, why am I a Buddhist? Why, what am I supposed to be getting out of this Buddhism that's going to help me in my daily life to change the way I work with my family, to change the way I deal with other employees, to help me get better grades at school, to assist me when I want to go and ask for an increase in pay with my employer, or when a disaster happens, do I learn anything in Buddhism that would give me relief from the suffering that has happened to me? And if I have a depression, do I have to take so many drugs that I only want to sleep? I am not functional anymore. I cannot help other people anymore. Do I have to you know, remain in that position or can I help myself by managing it along with a drug that is stabilizing me and helping me to see things more clearly, but can I work with it also and learn how to manage things that are, are serious problems in everyday life? 
And I'm talking about a rising fear, lack of confidence, withdrawal from people, serious cases of shyness, okay? And the doorbell just rang again, I'll be right back. It's getting funny. So what I'm going to do is try to show you what I've witnessed, some of what I've witnessed in the last 22 years working with this. And I began in the year 2000 to work with my teacher and train first. So I spent nearly six years uh, training with him before I became a nun. Then I became a nun and kept going. And in 2009, he asked me to go and teach. But I didn't understand parts of teaching and came back after teaching two or three retreats and said, I need at least two more years to work with you to understand how to do the interviewing and how to hear very carefully what is wrong with the student in their practice so that I can help them to find the solution and change just a little bit. So that's how my, my path was. But what is it that is so great about Buddhism in the way that we're teaching you from the text? Although the suttas, some will instruct you that they are all individual suttas, they're not like connected, they happened in this order. That's true. But in the suttas, there is an alignment that connects them together if they are the suttas that are talking about the meditation practice. And so in order to learn how to do it most effectively, we had to uh, sift out the, the precise uh, suttas that were the most valuable to you if we were teaching you. That's what uh, Bhante uh, Vimala Ramsey was able to do. So as an example, if I'm talking about the Majjhima Nikaya, which is the main source we like to use. Why do we want that Nikaya? It's because the whole teaching is in that Nikaya. But the Samyutta Nikaya gives you short discourses that are supportive of what you learn in the Majjhima Nikaya. And the Anguttara Nikaya is a system of not losing any of the pieces. And that's, I, I always, when I read it, I, I come to the point, this is really fantastic. None of the other traditions would have evolved without these Nikayas first. So this is like we're coming from the uh, Theravada means the school of the elders, you might say it was the school of the mother, because with the whole teaching sitting there, the other books are complementing and supporting and confirming what was given in this one. But what was given as the uh, clearest, fastest, immediately effective practice is not in one sutta anywhere. So you'll hear a little bit of this as I go through this. So one person asked me one time, uh, in other religions, we, we um, transform ourselves or transcend to something. But what do you transcend in Buddhism? I had kind of a blank face because for me, it was a transcending uh, all of the agony of suffering, transcending uh, the reactions I used to have when I was younger. And... Um, letting go of living a reactionary life that was angry about things that happened in the past so much that they were a burden to me. They were heavy, heavy, heavy on me, like carrying a huge weight I could not let go of and would fall when I went a little bit down in life, I would fall into those trap of replaying the stories of past things and that's not good for a person it's pulling them down it's not supporting them at a level where they can really make progress in life and be helpful to other people as well so 
other thing that happens in this particular time, especially now in the last two years and for a while longer, I think, uh, also is the future. And the future seems we want to fall into the future must be bleak. The present is not clear. The governments seem all to be confused and arguing and fighting and not really cooperating much to actually, they struggle to have peace, but they, they seem to have a problem in, in my own version about this. I think when you go to a peace conference, the very first thing that they should do around the table is have a discussion for at least one hour of that weekend that they spend together. And the subject should be how does war happen and how does peace work? If people took time to discover how war happens, maybe then they could come to a solution as to how peace could exist. But without being able to do that, it's a reactionary habit that seems to occur of this country would, would behave this way, that country would behave that way, this one does that. So we can't try this, we can't try that, we can't try that. And I, the hope, what everyone does when someone is gathering for the 12 or the eight or the six, whatever they are, having a meeting, you should all be sending meta and compassion to these people and you should be sending them a message, you know, about possibilities, you know, alternative possibilities, because at some point human beings have to get to the place where they will accept the option of considering alternative approaches to things. We seem stuck right now, the way things go. But anyway, coming back to the Dhamma now, the Dhamma has a lot to help that, you know. Okay, I'll tell you the story of the maestro first. And the maestro was a person who was a conducting uh, orchestras and, but felt had, uh, was good in his practice, but he felt powerless in certain relationships in his life. And he was wanting to become more bold and more confident, but he felt powerless. And Buddhism, by how does it help you to get out of that? How does it help you to get stronger? How does it help you to get more confident? It shows you the truth of how things actually work. This is what it does. In uh, the case of this case, by um, having the person use the baseline story about the past and the future and the present, he started to look very carefully. How many times do I react the way I always did in the past? in this situation that is new in the present time. But I just simply react because it's similar to something that happened in the past. And when he started to count how many times that happened, then when something popped up in his mind, he would let it go, relax, smile, and come back to what he was doing in the present time. And he would try to look more closely look more closely at what is essentially going on right here, right now. Does it have to do with the future? Should I look at that? No, the future is not here yet. Should I drag up the past to control what I do in the present? You learn from the past, but you don't have to repeat the same reaction every single time. That becomes a habitual behavior. So Buddhism shows you how to retrain your mind. Now, how is it showing you how to retrain your mind? Because when it gives you the path of right effort in the Eightfold Path, the right effort has four steps. And the first step is to recognize when you are simply reacting. And the second step is to release that reaction, immediately release your attention off that reaction and relax your head and smile as you come back. And that's training the mind to let go of the old way and bring up a new way by smiling, letting it go 
and looking more closely at what essentially is happening here and now. So every time you practice the Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation pattern of practice, the cycle itself, you are actually practicing the Four Noble Truths. You are seeing the suffering, seeing the cause, letting go of the cause and feeling cessation happen, actually experiencing for a split moment, no craving. Because when you relax between the relax and smile step, which is bringing up the wholesome and keeping it going, there's a tiny little space there, a tiny little pinpoint space, and there's no craving. And you get a look at what is actually a confirmation that a state of cessation of craving could even exist. Then you think a little bit when you're practicing and you're good enough to see that spot there when you're doing the let go, release, relax, smile, come back. When you can start to notice that actually there, it's a wake up call. Because if it's there for a split second, maybe that particular state can be extended to a longer period of time. That's what the Buddha was discovering gradually. So in this case, when he looked more closely at his reactions, this person changed his reactions to giving compassion to the person who was putting him down or criticizing him and just listened to them and agreed and agreed and agreed. But agreeing with a person doesn't mean you're going to actually follow through when somebody gives you advice, you say, okay, okay, okay. But you don't have to do it when the person's not there. And he would listen patiently and he would smile and then he would let the person leave. And then he realized he had not reacted. He had not defended himself. He didn't need to get emotional. And then he went on because Anicca told him it's past. It has changed. It's over. These are gifts of knowledge we learn in the practice. Second one was, um, you know, a, um, a case of depression with someone, and this was a medium level depression, but she, the woman had gotten onto a set of drugs to dominate her life. And the drugs made her so extremely balanced that she felt dead from it instead of having some movement like in your life like this okay gently she they thought the best thing to do just even the person out severely okay so there was no rise or fall and she didn't understand how depression was working so once she was taught how precisely that's happening. Then she learned that she could do something about it so it didn't take hold. She didn't take hold of it and hold on to it and develop it. Because you see the, the, the way this works has to do with who we are. In the texts are clearly telling us there's the Four Noble Truths. And then Four Noble Truths are basically there is suffering in life. There is a cause of it. There is the possibility of cessation of it. And there is a path or a way of practice that's balanced as a support system while you're practicing. The eightfold path is there and also the information you're learning. And so what is the information that we feel is the most important for you to learn for a smooth practice and to understand what's happening to you. That's what I want to show you. So the Four Noble Truths is the first part. And you say, what did the Buddha do with his Four Noble Truths? That's interesting, because we usually just hear there are Four Noble Truths. But the basically, all of the suttas are framed on the Four Noble Truths. If somebody comes to the Buddha and he has a problem, they're going to talk about the person suffering first. And then they're going to talk about what they're doing about it. And then the Buddha is going to say, but let's look closer 
and see what the cause of the suffering was, how that worked. And then let's see if there's a way to escape it or change the action that happens when this goes on. And he shows you how to do that. So it was the approach for his teaching, the, the uh, framing of his suttas and teaching the lessons. It was his approach for personal investigation. If we go into the Samyutta Nikaya, we can visit little suttas that say the path of the, his ex, exact path of investigation step by step. And what do we see? We see he's following his search directives. Where is the suffering? Where is the cause? What could be the cessation? How should we let go of that? And that's what he was working with that way. He also, in his career, I'll mention very quickly, he was a peacekeeper and people, meaning kings and leaders, came to him and armies for advice of what to do in situations. And his guidance in that arbitration that he did between people, families, people in cup, you know, couples and families and groups in the community, armies, kings, problems, everything. The arbitration line followed the four noble truths. It followed what is the challenge in this situation? What is the suffering? What is the, um, what do you think the the uh, cause of this challenge happening is, there's the second noble truth. And what do you think the solution to this problem should be? And that's touching on the cessation. How can we get to the cessation of this situation? And so if you were in charge, you tell me, and there's 10 people sitting at the table and they all do this page by page and they put it together and the leader takes it and he offers a solution, which they all agree will be guided by what? By the Eightfold Path, by how you live your life in during the time you try the solution, will this work? And this is what he was doing with uh, a lot of what he was doing in peace work. So we first have to look at what's he going to do about, what is she going to do about her depression is first, she, the person has to know what am I to begin with? So he teaches the person the five aggregates. So as a being, I consist basically of five things. I have a body, okay? I have uh, a body feeling. My body is from my head to my toes. I have feeling that I experience. And the Vedana or the feeling you can learn this with just painful or pleasant, but you take painful, pleasant, or neutral, or just painful and pleasant is enough for you to figure this out, is what we found out, okay? So you have the five aggregate being, they experience three kinds of feeling, pleasant or painful or neutral. The third one is perception, and perception by definition, perception perceives. This is what it's for. It comes from the word perceive. And as you perceive something, that is your perception. So what is your perception as you're going on seeing things? And so the perception perceives, it names things. So if this eye, you know, sees color and form, what says red book or red rose is perception very quickly. It's not big enough to be a link, okay? But it's a part of the process of the determining factor of whether the pleasant or painful feeling is occurring. And the next thing when the feeling is conditioned, craving arises. And craving is where I like something, which means I want it, which means I might get attached to it. Seeing something and even liking what it looks like isn't a problem in the context of this is happening in the present moment. The issue is, are you going to hold on to that? You see, if you talk about the end result of Nibbana, to be fully enlightened is to have a remainderless fading away and cessation of something. Remainderless, it's no remainder, no desire at all left 
to want it or have aversion to it. So when I like something, I want it, I have a desire to get moving towards attachment, I have to let go of that and just stay in the present time. And present time is changing all the time. So now I go to the next thing in life and the next thing in life like that, you see? Okay, so that's what's happening. Body, feeling, perception. Thoughts that arise in your brain are actually very impersonally operating your brain. You do not sit around and decide what your brain is going to do and not. But you can control your intentions and control if something pops up as a reaction, let go of it, relax and smile and come back and change the direction of where you're going to go. And remember something really important today is feeling is not emotion. Feeling is pleasant or painful or neutral. Emotions have names. I am depressed. I am sad. I am angry. You see, these have names. I am, I am in panic stricken, panic attacks, you see. But I am not that. You see, it's just different. It's not the feeling. It is feeling is just feeling. And we can almost put most of feeling into the anatomy of the body. Like we can say, you have the five aggregates. The last one is consciousness. And consciousness exists in the body, but it isn't active until it flows through a sense door. So that's what's happening. That's how it works. The six sense doors, we all know, eyes that see, ears that hear, nose that smells odor, tongue that tastes flavor, body that touches and has tactile, uh, you know, tangibles that it experiences, okay. And then there's the three, the, uh, the three kinds of feeling, we already mentioned that, and we just said how it works, where you get to the craving is after feeling, I comes into the picture. And everything becomes personal. So if we're looking at a chart of what happens in this lifetime, it goes contact as condition, feeling arises, feeling as condition, craving arises, craving as condition, clinging can arise. The story about running through your head. Why do I like it? Why am I pushing for attachment? Why do I not like it? And why am I trying to make it stop? You see, the dislike and the like is the craving and the clinging is the story about why you want this because it's always been this way. And when this feels this way, I always do this and I hold on and I jump into Bawa and Bawa is a storage area in your brain, really kind of back here. And it, um, it has all the reactions you've acquired from living in your, the environment that you've raised yourself up in, that you have grown up in, have formulated these reactions. You saw people in your family, you reacted that way, your mother, your father, your aunts, your uncles, that's how you learn. The kids learn by what they see. I told someone who was really angry at their children once, if you want to understand what's really going on, stand in front of the mirror. <laughs> so the adult needs to stand in front of the mirror and review what have you been saying to each other, the two adults, before you get angry at the child saying something he's heard you saying, this sort of thing. You need to look closely because the children, when they're very young, are coming up, learning to speak, learning to act, learning to react, by what is around them. You are the creator of the, uh, the actions to a large extent. They're working with a mirror system. Okay, so that tells us the aggregates, who we are, the six sense stores, the three kinds of feeling, and now what's happening. So the suffering is happening at the point from craving, I like it, I want it. This tension and tightness happens. You can feel it. You can learn to watch this in life. When you meet somebody, you hear something, then you feel this as you don't like it. And so that's your cue for your six R's. This is the cue for the steps of right effort of recognizing this tension is happening. So you let it go and then you relax your head, you smile and you come back 
you relax, smile, and come back to what you were doing. And you can step back now. Just listen to the person. You don't have to get involved. You don't have to react. Listen to them. Look at them in a different way. Look at them with compassion. Part of active compassion is to give the person space to have their pain. If somebody's yelling at you, criticizing you, putting you down, obviously there's something going on for that person. They're in pain somehow. And many times when people are yelling at you, the majority of time they're yelling at themselves. So it's stand back, let them get finished, take them to get some tea, give them some ice cream, <laughs> give them cookies and tea, but listen to what happened for that person. Find out why the person is so angry or upset. You can do that with people, okay? And you let it go by. This is the Zaudia effect that I talk about my one Marty word. <laughs> Zaudia, let it go. Relax, smile, come back to what you're doing and stay with what you're doing and don't let things from the past dictate what you're going to do in the present time. Don't let things push you around that might happen in the future, but they're not here yet. You have daily energy. Use it for your daily present time as it moves along the track in life because everything is moving. So this is what he's telling us, how everything works. The, the human beings he's telling us have two kinds of pain. They have physical pain that happens in their body that is very often set off from what's going on in their mind. Their mind is causing uh, cramps and sometimes causing, um, you know, uh, reactions, tight, jerky re types of reaction, movement in the body. These are painful things, are physical, and grief is mental. So the sorrow, lamentation, and pain is coming in the mind, and the uh, grief and despair type thing is coming in, I'm sorry, coming in the body, the first set, lament, sorrow, lamentation, uh, lamentation, pain, and that sort of thing is coming from the body part. And then grief and such is coming from the mind. But there's this connection. And the Nama Rupa tells us there is a connection and you can watch it happen in your own life. You know, this connection of mind and body. You think something, then you tense up. You see, it's how it works. Mind is the forerunner of all states we pass through. Trust that statement. Examine it for yourself. Watch it in your practice as you're learning. Then the reactions happen with the birth of reactions. They come from the past, as I said, or the future fears. Past lamentation and future fears. And this is causing an imbalanced mind. This is what was happening to her with the depression. And as we were explaining the steps, as I was explaining to them and writing them on a paper and she was listening to me, all of a sudden her eyes got very big. And she looked at me with tears in her eyes and said, you know, maybe this depression is not me. Maybe it's not really me. Maybe it's something happening. Yeah, that's what she got. Why do I like to keep teaching? Because when she got that, she began to realize that she could let that thought go, relax and smile and come back. And as she was smiling, just do what she's doing in the present time. And she doesn't have to allow this depression to take her over. Now, why did she think that the depression was going to take her over? Depression is a form of hindrance. And any of the hindrances, one of the saddest things that I've ever seen happen in Buddhism is that we don't go to the texts for our instructions anymore. And just in the Majjhima Nikaya, there are 11 suttas, nine or 11 suttas in there that are telling you specifically what the Buddha told the his monks and anybody else who was practicing. What are you supposed to be doing with the hindrances? You don't personally try to stop them. You abandon them. Now, when you abandon them, is that actually doing anything? Well, you know, I have this 
cap and I have it in my hand. And if I abandon it or just release it and let it go, I just go like that. I let it go. I let my attention off of it. Turns out, if we go to the Samyutta Nikaya, there's a wonderful section in there in the Bojanga Samyutta. It's talking to us about the hindrances in relation, direct relationship to the arising or the, uh, the non-arising of the seven enlightenment factors. Now, you need those seven enlightenment factors to come into a balance like these seven fingers here. You see, you need them not to be going like this, okay? You need them to just be in balance, all seven of them, okay? And when they come into balance, that's when you can fall into cessation when you're very deep in meditation. They will come into balance if you just kind of let them because you're not going to do anything. This is very hard for modern people to understand that the meditation will move along the easiest, the smoothest, the fastest, into the jhanas, down the line, down the path, and, and fall into cessation if I leave it alone and I just watch. But today, people don't want to watch. They want to compete with each other. They want to say, I am the first one to do this. I beat this other person. I'm on the top. I want to compete and all of that. It's not a good reason to learn the systems of uh, the spiritual things for the purpose of competing to prove anything. Now, I know someone who's gone through several systems and gotten to the highest level of each system. And boy, that is fantastic. Absolutely. But the person didn't do it for the reason of beating anybody. The person just was able to and just was invited by the teacher to go to the next system and the next system and the next system and mastered all of these in the background. It was the right reason for the person to pursue all those other things out of curiosity. Then suddenly the person found the tranquil wisdom insight meditation and came to realize that as far as the meditation path was concerned, that that path could be accomplished if the person got out of the way and allowed it to happen. And so when we see the hindrances, we need to remember if you're having trouble with the hindrances in your practice, what the Buddha said the actual order of the day was. What was the order? for his monks directly. He said, an obstacle will never become an obstruction unless you personally engage in it or indulge it. That means if you pay attention to it, it will become an obstruction. There you go. That's the law in Alagadupama Sutta, Majima Nikaya number 22 in the very front section Probably it's in part six and in part 10, it repeats itself. But that lesson, he said, when have you ever heard me uh, tell you to become involved with something that comes up that is a distraction, which is a hindrance, you see, or a disturbance. Or There's 11 different names for this stuff. <laughs> it's funny. But whatever you want to call it, you have to remember one thing about the hindrance. In the, in the, uh, in the um, Bojanga Samyutta, where it's talking about that whole thing, that whole section is really talking about the hindrances and what keeps the enlightenment factors from coming into alignment. But in the discussion section, it goes into it in detail, telling you precisely that what will stop the enlightenment factors from arising and getting perfected, which means getting into balance. It just means they come into balance very clearly. Okay. They're not going like this anymore. They're just balancing. Is That happens naturally if you just stop fooling around with them. If you just do what you're supposed to do in the deeper state, which is just become a watcher, a witness, 
but an inactive witness that's just alert and watching what could happen. And in the deeper states, it's difficult because you have things that are always going on in life and you get to a deeper state for two hours, three hours, and it's just dark and you're wondering what, what's here. Wait a second, uh, what's happening? Wait a minute, you mean there's nothing happening? Well, well I can't stay here. It's nothing's happening. <laughs> One person said this for five years. Finally, I said to the person, you know, if you pretend you're an explorer and this place that you get to where there's just darkness and nothing is happening at all, your job, we're paying you as a scientist, we're gonna pay you to come and tell us what is nothingness. And she looked at me kind of nice. Like, yeah, but you're the first one, like the first one, Admiral Byrd to the North Pole, you know. And then he has to come back and tell you what the North Pole is like and explain it. Well, this is like a set of darkness where there's nothing but a dark lake sitting in front of you. There's no wind, no movement, nothing is happening. And if you start to get bored, that means that you're getting anxious because you want something to be there. I know I wanted something to be there very much, okay? But there's nothing there, okay? So what you need to be doing, he's telling you, sit back and watch, just witness what is happening. And maybe you'll see a little wiggle underneath the water, like in the evening when the lake lakes get very quiet, there's feeding time for the fish when they're all jumping around. And after that gets, really at dusk it gets really really quiet and this, it's just like glass but then you can see a little ripple underneath the moment you see the ripple at all you just relax and the mind the brain will go it'll do the whole let go relax smile and come back and you just you're just smiling gently as you're watching you're just smiling because i told you you were going to see a wiggle <laughs> that's what's going on okay so in order to change reactions into responses we and change our behavior patterns this is the gift that he gave this woman she could change once she understood how everything was happening for a depression to arise how it is not hers it is like, it's like if it was me it's not me it's not mine it is not myself it's not my fault my brain just brings up these these thoughts and they just happen. But she's learning. She's learning that she has power over her mindfulness, which is her observation power. And that the point of the meditation, the meditation is observing the movement of mind's attention in order to see the impersonal nature of it and how it moves by itself without you asking it to. She was sitting there, you know, she was knitting, she was knitting and sitting there with her knitting needles, you know, knitting like this, okay? And suddenly she got depressed. And then she had to put these away quietly. Her husband and her son were watching TV on the floor in front of her. She has to put those down, stop knitting, put her basket aside, quietly leave the room. This was her remedy in those days. Go in her bedroom, turn out the light, lie down and cry herself to sleep because she was so depressed. She had no idea what was happening when the depression came. But by explaining to her how it comes and gives a sign that it is coming is the change in the body, the change in the tension. Now, this is interesting because if you are contemplating teaching twin, you should remember something about the Goenka system or the Vipassana system anywhere. In Vipassana, the attention is out here on the, uh, the signal coming from the outer part of the body. You feel things inside also, but really they, they're very good when they, these students are very good if they come to us at and they've been doing the Vipassana for a time, they're very good at noticing something here or here or here or any part in the body. So the secret is when I'm telling you the tension is arising, that's a signal craving is coming up. 
And the signal, the symptom of craving is a rising tension and tightness. This is the law of the craving. And you can't change this. Every time you go, I like, I don't like, there's a change in tension, you see? If you learn to spot this tension, just notice it. That's your signal to just smile at it and let go, relax, smile, and come back to what you were doing in the practice. I don't care where your object is. I don't even care if you're doing breathing meditation. If you learn how to do this, your breathing meditation is suddenly going to take off because you're not going to pay attention to hindrances anymore because you know you cannot forcefully personally destroy, annihilate, eradicate, subdue, or suppress a hindrance or try and stop it. Because the moment you do that, there's a secret about the hindrance that the Samyutta Nikaya told you. It said, careless attention to the hindrance is what will prevent the balancing of the enlightenment factors in the system. So if you pay attention to the hindrance, you're giving it food. It's very simple. It's nutriment. And in that sutta, it talks about the nutriment for the hindrance. What is the nutriment for it? The food for it is my personal attention. Well, he pointed this out to me and I saw this. Then I went, wow, I've been working so hard to stop these hindrances. What in the world was I doing? And I have heard of people being caught with the hindrances for months. And the dark night of the soul, I can't do anything if I sit and I start to get hindrances and I suffer and I try to push and I try to put. And every time you do that and try to stop it, suffocate it, subdue it, suppress it, you're telling it the hindrance is going whoopee, food, food, food. And then it goes, you know, goes away for a little while. And then because you have a hard concentration, you try to push it down. Yeah, but here's a problem with that. Mm -hmm. The problem is when you leave that retreat, you can't do that at home in life. You cannot handle it that way. So you might stop it finally hard by doing that hard enough, but there was nothing exhausting in what Siddhartha figured out was the real answer to the practice to go through far enough to really have the mind open. That's another thing. So bringing, uh, bringing, suffering, um, bringing suffering forward, the hindrance seems to make you suffer, but you don't have to, you can just smile at it. You can even give it tea and tell it to sit in the other room. You're busy, you're gonna meditate in this room. You sit out there when you're finished having tea and cookies, just get up and leave, I'll clean it up later. <laughs> you can play that game. Because the hindrances are innocent. They haven't done anything to you. The problem with hindrances are self-inflicted by us because we don't acknowledge how a hindrance works. That's the fact. The hindrance is innocent. The responsibility lies with me to learn how a hindrance works. What is the sign of the arising hindrance? And what do I have to do to just not feed it anymore? Now, how logical is all of this? Well, let's pretend you're in a village and an army is coming to attack your king's army and it's coming up from the other side of the mountain. So the best thing, according to Sun Tzu in the art of war, okay, the best thing you can do if you know they're coming and it's going to take three days is if you know the road. Just go out there and take apart the roads so they have no supply route to feed their army. They cannot come to where you are. They cannot stay where you are because they're going to have to return because you took away their supply route. That's what you're doing with the hindrances. If you want to think they're attacking you, well, then go to the book of, you know, the art of war and look at what the different ways are. And one of the ways was to spy on the enemy and find out exactly how the enemy works. And that's what I just did for you. I just showed you exactly the truth of the hindrance and you have to test it, don't believe me. You, need, you have to test it because one of the rules of the Buddhist teaching is he won't even let you stay in his school if you show up and refuse to practice 
by knowledge and vision. And this approach to meditation of observing to acquire or attain knowledge and, um, and vision of how things actually work is a step before knowledge and wisdom can grow. Wow. And knowing that, that exists in the Upanisa Sutta, that's telling you, that's right in the middle of it, where the person came in the Upanisa Suttas from the Samyutta Nikaya, it's called Proximate Cause. And it's in the uh, Nidanavaga in the book 12. And you can find it in there on page 53. It starts on the bottom of page 53, 553. Let's make that clear. Okay. And if you read that, and you will hear that this knowledge and vision of how things actually work, these are little tiny attainments that happen along the line of development or what that sutta is about. This sutta is special because that sutta tells you about ignorance. And with ignorance as condition, formations arise. With formations as condition, uh, the um, consciousness arises. With consciousness as condition, nama rupa arises. With the uh, which is um, body and mind connection or material. The material you remember it this way. Remember the material ear is the elemental part of this. And then there's a mental process that happens when the ear operates or any of the sense doors. There's the physical sense base and there is the mental operation of that sense base in happening in conjunction with the object. And then you have contact happen. So you need the sense base, the eye, the form, the eye consciousness, then you get contact. And then with contact as condition, feeling arises. With feeling as condition, craving arises. With craving as condition, clinging arises. With clinging as condition, habitual tendencies or habitual emotional reactions, they arise. And with the habitual tendency as condition, then jati happens, the birth of that reaction. We're talking about one event in life at a time within this lifetime. That's what we're talking about here. And then the birth of it occurs. And then they don't talk about in the sutta about aging and death. They flip it and they say, and then there is suffering. Because that link had stuff about sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. That's the suffering. Suffering occurs. So when suffering occurs to a person, a lot of times people in the world will go to the church and try to get in and, and just talk to the minister and see what's really happening. In this sutta, what happens in the Upanisa Sutta? It was when suffering arises, you go to the temple and you find, you find a way uh, to practice and ask them to show you how to practice. And they, you have to have faith when you start. So the faith we're talking about is just put your mind it, that when you're trying to figure out, can the Buddha help me out in this whole situation about suffering I'm going through? For the time being, while I try this, I'm going to put my faith in this man who turned out to be the Buddha. And I'm going to find out what he figured out and I'm going to do what they tell me for the instructions. I'm going to put my faith that he really did find something. After all, he spent six years trying to find it. And he tried everything that you don't have to try. He suffered through all kinds of torturous practices to discover this. But it, they all failed. None of them helped him open his mind. If you go to Majima Nikai number 36, and you go to section 30 and start reading there. The front part of that suit is telling you about the heaviest things he tried, where he almost died, okay? And they had to do with breathing less and less and less and less till he turned blue and not eating from seven, you know, beans to six, five, four, three, two, one bean a day. And he starved himself to death and his skin turned black and his stomach sank and he could, you could see his backbone if you look at the front of him all the way to his backbone and his hairs fell out on his whole body and his skin turned black and he, they thought he was dead. But um, 
that's when they say the devas came and said, no, 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 you can't die. You're the Buddha. You have to keep going. You're going to teach us everything. Don't die now. Please get up, get up. He didn't want to get up. And he did manage to sit there. And then a woman, Sujata, brought him the rice, the rice, milk, milk rice. And he started to eat that. He started to get stronger. And then he washed in the river. Then he starts to eat for a while. We don't know how long, but to get healthier before he then starts to try to figure out the last time under the tree, you know, he's going to go through. So I like to think of this when he sits under the tree, that's when he remembers when he was young, you know, when he, in the third watch of the night, he has a memory happen to him. It, it says in one of the suttas about the time his father was at the harvest festival and he was young and he was left alone and he sat under a tree by himself, a rose apple tree. And no one was there. And the story is they came back and he was lifting off the ground. He was so light, he was rising up off the ground because he fell into a jhana and he had completely let go of everything. So he was so light, he started to rise up off the ground. And they were all excited that he had gotten into the jhana simply by he remembers that he didn't do anything to get into that jhana at that time. This is what he remembers. So then he thinks about pleasure also in that the note in that sutta, um, because he said there's a different approach here, because why should I be afraid of feeling pleasure when I'm practicing my meditation? Because there is nothing unwholesome at all, no unwholesome thing that is making me feel that pleasure, nothing unwholesome at all. It is simply rising up inside me, all the joy is rising up inside me and filling me up, you see, inside. And I shouldn't try to stop that because I know a Nietzsche, I know everything is impermanent. And then in the sutta, I'm talking to you about the Upanisa Sutta. It tells you when you start to practice, what happens first? The first time you ever sit down, you've been in a city and you're pushed and pulled and full of tension and stress. And what do they tell you the first time when you start sitting? <laughs> they tell you, sit down, be quiet, don't move. <laughs> and if you just do that with your eyes closed and just relax a little bit for half an hour, when you come out, you think, my gosh, I really feel good. Even if you were just breathing and doing that and nothing else, you would find a lot of relief pretty quickly. So it's a stabilizing thing, it's mechanism there, okay. So the first time you practice, uh, you feel this relief and that's Pomoja. And the second time you practice, you fall into PT and PT comes uplifted joy, just lightness and joy. And if I ask you, why do you feel so happy? Why are you smiling when you come into your interview? You're probably going to say, I don't know, but I really feel happy. I really feel happy because you feel this uplifted feeling and you want to smile. And that's what happens. And then when that passes away, because all these states are also affected by Anicca, you need to say that to yourself a couple of times and try to remember it. So you don't come to me and say, well, I had the fourth jhana and I got the fourth jhana in the last retreat I was in. I should start here this time, not here at the beginning. And we just look at you and trying to figure out why didn't anybody teach you about Anicca? You don't have the fourth jhana in your pocket. It isn't something you can just have it. These states never happen the same way twice in any practice. And you can't repeat what you did yesterday. If you go in with that attitude, probably nothing will happen. Usually nothing happens because you want it. You always go in an individual sitting simply to see what happens next. And remember, you don't control it. You want to witness it and watch what happens next and keep smiling and keep uplifted. It helps to keep you in this present time and anything else that comes up from the past or the future, you just let it go and relax and smile and come back here and keep watching whichever level you're at. So when you do come back and practice again, when, okay, when the PT falls away, when it, it fades out, what's left is tranquility, and that's pasadi. 
in the past that D is feeling like the whole body feels like this tranquility through it and nothing is disturbing you, but that will fade away. When that fades away, sukha is left and sukha is Buddhist happiness. And that happiness is inside of us in the heart and in your chakras, throughout the chakras. And you feel this contentment but it has no real energy vibration in it, but it's a contentment. You see, it's a kind of, um, it is a form of equanimity on the development of equanimity. It is a form of it, okay? And then what happens? Then when that passes away, then you decide to practice again. And this time when you practice, collectedness, the samadhi comes into the right level of observation and it's the right level of concentration we call it collected a gently collected mind that allows us to watch what's happening the way sariputta watched what was happening in majima nikaya number 111 which was anupada sutta step by step and we realize now that we can experience that also if we are not tight and tense and concentrating too hard we can see what he saw step by step one by one Okay. And then when you uh, come back and experience the collectedness is perfect, the next time you're sitting, or maybe in that sitting, this is when you experience a particular attainment that is noted. You attain knowledge and vision of how things actually work. Knowledge and vision of how everything actually works. That's what it means. And when you, you reach that experience, it means you're understanding more about dependent origination, which is what we were actually talking about here when we're talking about how it works from contact, feeling, craving, clinging, uh, reaction and birth of reaction. That is part of dependent origination. And so you're, le you're learning more and more about that by practicing the cycle of this practice, okay? And then what happens is after that, um, uh, the next time you sit is where you go into the nibbida, experiencing the um, the uh, disenchantment, which really means you get to a place where you really don't want to go to the movies and go shopping and run around all over the place. You'd rather spend time to see how deep does this rabbit hole go is the expression. You're discovering things and you're seeing more and more inside. You want to know how far does this go? How far can I go with it? And what your, what your actually objective is when we say Nibbana, there's not just one Nibbana. There are several mundane Nibbanas along the path that occur to you all the time, okay? You're having these little tiny ones that become little larger ones and then become the attainment, fruition, attainment, fruition, attainment, fruition, and attainment, fruition to get all the way as far as you can go. And you don't have to go all the way. After the nivida, the disenchantment comes the thing called dispassion. And some people don't want to go that far. And that's fine. By the time you're working in the jhanas and you are experiencing these jhana levels are levels of gradual cessation. More and more and more and more and more. Cessation of what? Tension and tightness. Cessation of personal involvement how, what is it like to experience an experience of no experience where there's no personal pushing involved in it at all? You're simply steering the boat, simply turning the wheel, going straight. That's what he was doing. And this is what he finds out. But what happens to his mind if he does have an experience a larger left kind of experience with the Nibbana. What is happening at those levels where we think that they're going into the attainment, then the fruition, attainment, fruition type thing. When that's happening, what is happening to your brain? I, I ask a lot of questions. <laughs> and that's something about me. And, and what is happening here is you are rebooting your mind. Your brain is like a computer. And when you have trouble in your computer, you, you, you troubleshoot a couple things. If you can't fix it, what do you do? You restart your computer. And what does restart mean? 
it's the old term in the beginning with computers, we reboot the system. And what happens when you reboot the system up here? You reboot it so that you're not thinking about the past stuff and you're not thinking about the present stuff. You're just coming back with a clean, a clean uh, set of equipment to watch the present time. That's what I think is happening because of the reports of what's happening to your seeing and hearing and smelling and tasting ability and what's happening. How does that happen? The mind is the forerunner of all states. All states are mind made. And it also comes down into affecting your body. And so if we understand how this works, we learn to let go, relax, smile, and come back. Okay. So we talked about how this is all happening and what happened for this woman was she realized the depression was not her. It was not her fault. It was, she was not to blame. There were, this was physically happening because she, when she doesn't know what's happening, how can she stop it? And gradually over a course of about two, three months, working with her doctor, she was able to reduce the dosage, some of the medication she was having in cooperation with her doctor, not on her own. You don't fool around with those drugs on your own. And this stuff does not cure depression. We cannot say that because there are so many variables in the types of depression that exist. And there are so many levels on a scale of one to 10 of the level of degree of severity of each of those different types of disorders. So we can't say that, but it can help you be active in the management of depression. That is correct. That we can say very certainly. So a couple of things the Buddha teaches us, teaches us things that um, we want to remember. One of them is that in life, pain is inevitable for all human beings, but suffering is optional. What do I mean? I mean, I just gave you an example of why it's optional. A person who has no knowledge, look how much she was suffering. Now she has knowledge. Now she can know what to do and see if she can stop this arising by replacing it, only by replacing it. We cannot stop something so that it stays away unless we replace it and retrain our brain. That is why the cycle of practice is doing two things. It is purifying your brain and it is retraining the habitual behavior pattern of your brain to a new habitual tendency, which is wholesome. Loving kindness, compassion, joy, balanced mind. That's what you want to train your brain. So you have to know something. And modern science has told us something about 12 years ago, they discovered a thing called neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity means the flexibility of the mind and the ability to learn by repetitiously telling the brain a new way for it to behave and setting up a new neural pathway and letting go of the reaction pathway. We used to just react, re react into somebody's face, yell back, argue all the time, all the rest of it. But we're learning there is an optional alternative way that we can handle situations, but it's not easy to change. And I can't tell you, just stop doing that. It won't change anything. You can change it for a week, just don't do it. But after that, it comes back because you didn't replace the neural pathway with a new one. This is what they understand now. So what is the importance of neuroplasticity in relationship to this is very important because a lot of people come to get help to change. And that's good because Bhante of Imola Ramsey always told me, People need to come to Buddhism if they want to change. They should want to change. You can expect to change. If you follow this, it just will naturally make you calmer, more patient, uh, a little quieter, and be able to know what to do in many situations in life, you see?
So we, you need to understand that it, it doesn't change you, you change you, okay? By practicing the pattern of the, of the meditation. Okay, so that's one thing. Pain is inevitable, it happens to everybody in life, but how you suffer or not to suffer, to suffer or not to suffer, that is the Buddhist Shakespearean question. To be or not to be, to suffer or not to suffer. That's your question, your choice. Once you have the information and the laws of how things work in the practice, what is the purpose? Other classes we talk about, what is the real purpose of an object in meditation? Why do you have one? Did you ever think about that? There is a law about that object. There is a law about hindrances. There are many laws that exist, like the law of Anicca is firm and applies to absolutely everything. Everything in the universe is impermanent. The only thing that isn't, that it, the only thing that is permanent is impermanence. That's it, <laughs> that's it, okay. So we learn these questions, you, you're these little dew drops. These are, these are Dhamma drops. Whatever you think and ponder on, that becomes the inclination of your mind. This is, again, something in Buddhism where you're learning the power of mind. What you think about affects the direction your mind goes in. And why is that important? Because mind is the forerunner of all states. So the mind happens first, and an intention happens, then an action, and then there it, it, the birth of the action comes out and there's a reaction. You see these things, but everything starts by what you keep in your mind. So keeping wholesome thoughts in your mind is extremely important. This is, this is the right thought thing or wholesome uh, movement of mind's attention, wholesome pictures that you keep imaging, imaging, wholesome imaging in your mind, that you keep images that are importantly going to help you is important to keep in your mind. Another one is mind is the forerunner of all states. Mind is chief, mind made are they. We already talked about that. It's the very first verses, the first couplet that you find in the Dhammapada, the very first one. So it means all wholesome or unwholesome states. They started here. And unwholesome states tend to have this tension and this whole let go, relax, smile, come back. You see? And give yourself the directive. That's where you get to steer. I'm going to, to approach this whole thing in a wholesome manner, or are you going to go in an unwholesome manner and get hot headed and react and yell and scream and argue and everything else? No, it doesn't make sense. It's exhausting to you, it's exhausting to the other people everything, it doesn't work. So you choose another route, but you have to do it every time. And every time the old way comes up, you have to let it go, relax, smile, come back and come in with the new one and tap the brain the same way every time. They learned that repetitious change that is done the same way every time reformats re, uh, the brain. So we're not stuck. This is the one where we're just not stuck anymore. Then another one here is interesting. What you do in the present time dictates what happens in the future. And that's a statement of karma. So what this is simple. What you put out, that's what you get back. What you give to somebody else, you can expect it coming back at you in the future. Be careful. Be careful how you treat people because that's how people will end up treating you. You know, the truth of this whole thing is if you change your mind, the way the Buddha is talking about purifying it and retraining it this way, then you change your life. So you change your mind, you change your life. That's another statement. Another one is the more smiling thoughts that we have, the more inclined mind will tend towards happiness. You build happiness is not something we can catch. We can hold on to, we can make it stay all the time, but we can feed it. We have to present what's called bumi to it. Bumi is the soil that happiness comes from. Happiness is a byproduct of the way that you live. That's what happiness is. And so it's important for you to 
to put as many smiles and feed that to your mind so that you stay lighter when something comes at you or feels like it's happening to you. And Buddhism is about taking the weight off of you, the weight off of you and putting down the sack of the past things that you went through and letting go of the future pack. And when you stand up, oh boy, do you feel lighter and easier to work and everything else. Patience is the way to Nibbana. It's the way to reboot your mind and start again. When you reboot the computer, it goes back to the default of the operation of the operating system how it operates goes back to the original operating system as the principle, so everything should work clearly. I liked the um, computers one time, and I don't know if they still do it or not, but they went through what part of their development where they said, if it's not working, then change the date on the computer and go back five days and see if it'll operate better. I thought that was cute. I did. <laughs> you could go back five days and set it up again. Always remember one thing about life. Nothing is happening to you. This is a, a really changing thing when you hear this. Nothing is happening to you. I'm telling you now, everything is happening from you. I'm telling you, you are powerful in a special way, not a forceful, tense, tight, angry way. You are a powerful person as a human being. If you learn, how everything works. And this is the gift the Buddha gave us. The only way any obstacle can stop you that pops in your mind is if you feed it and pay, if you engage in it, then it will become an obstruction. So let it go. Everything, just let it go and keep smiling. Okay, floor is open. I didn't quite make it an hour, did I? <laughs> <laughs> but floor is open for 10 minutes now. Okay. Anybody have questions? Yes. Amish, did you have one? Hello, Hello oh. sister. Yes. Oh, okay. You? Yeah. I got a, I got a couple of couple of questions. Um, the first one was um, uh, when you were talking about the uh, hindrances and learning to um, not to feed them, um, and but also not trying to suppress them. Uh, and so this this is this is a very subtle teaching about control because you're looking not to be controlled by the hindrances, but also not to try to control them yourself. And that's a yeah. subtle balance. And that's yeah. a very, um, yeah. and I think that's, that is, if you like, uh, a, a very early teaching as you get used to TWIM, which, which kind of is a continual teaching all the way through the practice. All the time, absolutely all, all the time. You're training the brain to this new thing. And the, the remember that the hindrance uh, that will arise is this craving has the tension and tightness symptom. And by giving you the symptom, the, um, the lower the tension becomes in you as you're practicing. You start with, you've heard me say it starts this much and at each time you you let go, relax a smile and come back. It comes down a tiny bit. And as you're practicing the next time you let go, relax, smile, let go, relax, smile, come back, let go, relax, smile. You're lowering the tension. Now, as you're lowering the tension, the, the, uh, the subject is lowering the tension, the meditator, then when it's arising in the body, you're going to notice it sooner, the lower the tension comes in you. So stop doing anything. Stop, stop yeah. trying to make anything happen. You don't make anything happen. And all of a sudden this stuff takes off. So by letting go of trying to control the hindrance, you're absolutely right. That's how you gain control of your meditation working right. Huh? <laughs> so it's what, a trade-off. What I'm interested in also is that, you know, maybe you're instigating motivation at the start of your practice. Um, 
it, which may be a, a longing or it may be a, a desire, that in itself, as this tension goes down or lowers, becomes a tension itself. I don't get that. Longing is listed in the hindrances as a, yeah. a hindrance. Longing is a hindrance. Yeah. So you would uh, treat that the same way the moment you see that you're longing for this something to stop, you that you have to let go of that relax smile and come back. Longing is like long, not just longing to get to Nibbana. It's not just that one. It is longing for something to happen that happened yesterday. It is longing for me to have better control in my practice. It is longing in any terminology. See? Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm, com I'm comfortable with that. But also there is what, what perhaps initially felt like a wholesome motivation to practice. Um, uh, also then as things get more subtle, they, the unwholesome elements of what seemed wholesome sort of come through. So the, the wanting to, the wanting to move, uh, to, to sit or to, um, to practice more, or, um, uh, it's, we, from what I can see, we need to, uh, ease back from all of that. Uh, if you like, on the, on the pressure. Yeah, yeah. I understand you need to ease back on all of it. So it's easing back on de desire. And all of these things are hooked into desire, which is a hindrance. Just one minute, Sarma, because Avinash, he had a question first. And I- No, no, I it. want to speak about the, this longing. Okay, okay. Go ahead, Sarma. Longing, yeah? longing is nothing but craving. Second, mm -hmm. Bhante told, if you are serious about, Bhante Vimaladamsi told, if you are serious about anything or any longing or anything, that itself is attachment to you. Sure, absolutely. Well, the moment you move towards any hindrance at all or get involved with it, that's craving. But so one craving, right craving is tension and tightness. So you got to go down one more level when you're talking about it. We can say something is craving. So don't do that. It's craving. But the student is sitting there saying, what does that mean? What, what am I supposed to do? You're supposed to be watching the indicators for craving, the symptom for it. Knowing it's craving is the first level. The next level deeper is knowing the tension and tightness in the craving. Yeah. But, but Bhante used one rider. That is Chanda. If, if you are longing for the jhana or anything, that will not come under your uh, craving. Okay, now we have to be careful of the word chanda. Chanda is a neutral word that, depending on the situation you're using chanda in, it can two, be two a, bad, a bad word, a bad kind of desire, or a good kind of desire. So it's good to start out with the intention I, I'm going to go through, but not... You can't have too much desire involved with that. The intention for you to come and meditate each day, the intention for you to work on your development is one thing. But if you go too far, it turns, the chanda goes like on that side instead of that side. It's a crazy word. It's one of those words that goes either direction. Yeah, thank you. Can one case is can one case I, can only one thing. Yeah. If you are serious about anything, that amounts to craving only. That's correct, if you're too serious. So that's why one of the best advices, I listened to a sound bite. I need to make sure I put it somewhere for you all. And now I don't know what I did with it, but I'll find it again. Bhante goes on and talks about, you cannot have too much joy in your life. You cannot have too much joy. You cannot smile too much. The smiling is actually opening this and keeping it open. So you smile through everything. I mean, I smiled when I got bitten by the tick. I smiled when I cut my foot. I had smiled through everything. When I had the automobile accident, I had the nurses laughing and they had me in a brace on the, on the gurney and they were going to x-ray on me. And I'm laughing and they're trying to figure out what's wrong. Did she bump her head? No, I was just kind of amused at how everything just happened so fast. And here we are in the hospital you know and <laughs> i'm thinking what a day this is <laughs> and they don't understand why i'm not upset but i'm better off with my body if i'm laughing at the ridiculous of the situation instead of taking it really serious 
because one time I had an accident and I'm telling you it was bad because I was lying there underneath something and I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, what if I can't walk? What will happen in the future? What will, what if, what if, what if? And I was getting tenser and tenser. And the first thing the EMT said to me was relax. And I started laughing because I was stuck way far away from what we were doing in the accident. And it helps you to stay in the present time, you see? So actually what we're talking about here is pulling ourselves out of the present time, you see? With any of this, right? And a lot of that, that uh, you know, craving, craving, it's craving, is coming from what happened before. It was craving then, it has to be craving now. Nope, it doesn't. No, it doesn't have to be. You can let it go and turn it into an observation and a learning experience no matter what's happening to you in life including dying, including that. It can be an observation to the last moment. It's an interesting thing. Okay, you, can I, can I ask Avish, Avinash, tell me what your question is first, okay? I'm sorry, I was, everything started blinking on the screen. That was good, I'm trying to get more questions, yeah. Okay, Avinash, yeah. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, actually I'm uh, trying to ask the same question mm -hmm. and how to avoid uh, craving for jhanas and, and like to, to avoid uh, okay to avoid craving for the jhanas you set it up in your mind these jhanas are, are just the word jhana is supposed to be this big huge humongous accomplishment and yeah okay it is but <laughs> it is but the question is it's actually you should look at it as these are levels of cessation that the person can go through. Levels of gradual, um, gradual cessation of going one, two, down, 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 down to zero tension and tightness, at which point you fall over into cessation. And that's how you get there. So if you if you think too much about jhana, just let the term jhana go and just say these are just. Uh, points of cessation that are getting less and less tension in my body and in my mind. Look at it that way. Don't even think about these levels. And what I'm telling people right now is if you're reading the books, frankly, put them away and practice more and read less because you do not want to be practicing thinking about where you are. It's unimportant. Until you get into infinite space, it's interesting to know that one, and it's interesting to know the mental realms, but going through the first four Arupa Jhanas, it's not important for you to, to actually know and see and pick apart and analyze where you are in each one. It's totally unimportant. You're going to slow yourself way down. You can do that later on. Later on, you can make a determination. You can sit down and you can say, I will sit no higher than the first jhana. And you will find yourself in the first jhana for a whole hour. Then if you want to pick it apart, be my guest. Be my guest and do it. But there's no reason I'm saying to pick it apart. There's no instruction anywhere to pick it apart. They're just showing you what happens in each one. And when you're first learning, go ahead, go through the system once as far as you can and then as you are sitting longer and longer if for instance you're in say nothingness and you get bored i might say to you okay sit once and see if you can make a determination work so you say i will sit no higher than the second jhana and see what happens and take a break and do that a little bit but then come back and, and allow yourself to go through in the retreats or 10 days long you can actually get through the whole path you can, but you have to stop analyzing, stop dissecting, stop being concerned about that and just sit and watch and then see as it goes along gradually. You understand? I'm in a Zoom, I'll come back to you. Yeah, okay, okay. I, I, I want to speak. <laughs> is that okay? You get that, Avinash? Uh, uh, Mataji's uh, reply is somewhat yes, advanced. Yes, yes, Mataji. Yeah. Okay. I would like to tell you this way. Banteji tells in the one of the talks, how much time I sat for the meditation is not correct. But how many times I did 
six hour process that is only three three items we will touch recognize release and relax smile even smile that's, also. Oh, okay but be careful that be careful because that's recognize release relax smile come back those you there are five pieces you have to do don't cheat okay. the only time you can go to three or just to a single relaxed step is when you are in quiet mind for a long time like two hours three hours oh like by that by that time the brain is ready to jump and do the six but you say relax he's, he's at the beginning relax. he's at the beginning one minute one minute yeah. please allow me to speak yeah <clears throat> Yeah. Always we will have some smiling face. Yeah. Even you identify immediately, you will get the smiling face. So these three steps are followed. If it is severe, then you have to repeat it. If you are well, doing fifty, you're speaking. I don't know. I don't know if you're teaching yet. I'm but... not teaching. I'm, let me complete. Okay. Myself. Okay. So wait a second. Wait. Let me just say this. It's okay for you to say this to me, but when you're sitting in front of 30 people, the moment you said, always we have this smile and it's there. That's not true with all 30 people. <laughs> I, I, I would like to tell you. 30 or 40 people. <laughs> this one. When you recognize immediately, you don't have the smiling face, you will identify. It is quite natural. First, you will be going to a smiling face and then complete the three steps and come back. Even if you do 50 times like this, you are changing your personality. Slowly it will come. So you will be in jhana only. This uh -huh. is what okay. actually in the beginning you have to think about it, doing uh, this particular relaxed step. This relaxed yeah. step will lead to eight path, eight uh, fold path. That yep. is the beauty of this twin. That's right. When you are right. following eight fold path, you are almost in jhanas only. That's Please. right. Please. That's right. That's okay. very good. That's what very, I want to convey. Good. That beyond that, I won't speak. <laughs> that is very good. Yeah, but it's very good. The smiling has to be starting to come naturally for the person. That's why we have the individual interviews. That's why we try to work with you very, very closely so we can see that you're doing that part. Yeah. You, you had another question. Yeah. You're 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 on you're not your your mic is off. Okay. okay. Here we go. Uh, yeah, it's around the intention, and I, I wanted to ask you if uh, because you in part of your talk you were, you were describing how um, you know the benefit of this for people is that they 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 become calmer and more patient, and they can become quieter in times of of, of uh, a disturbance and. Um, uh, you know, they're able to help many of their life situations. And what, what my question is, if someone comes to TWIM with that as an aspiration, does that change the way they experience TWIM compared to an aspiration, which is, if you like, from a Buddhist point of view, which is to come off the wheel? Um, it's, it's a, a, well, yeah, I'm wondering. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering if, the, if the, the, the intention changes the experience. People come to meditation in all different direct, from all different directions <clears throat> to get all different things. And one of the things I'm leaning towards here in India very much so is I want to teach Buddhists what happened and I want them to understand the gifts the Buddhist gave, Buddha gave us. But at the same time, I want to be a universal teacher. And this is falling into place for me. This, this Euro tour that I'm going to be doing is exactly what I've always wanted in the back of my mind. It's almost like I manifested it. And here it comes, you know, because this is a reaching out to all human beings who need to have a stabilizing uh, practice for the purposes that we talk about, like we mentioned here, okay? But it doesn't have to be a, even about getting off the wheel if you don't wanna teach it to them that way. Teaching person about the wheel is strictly, it is a Buddhist concept. You have to understand that. So if you start to teach uh, people from a different religion and throw in the, the wheel of samsara, 
tremendously, you're, you should be teaching an all Buddhist audience, in my opinion. This is my opinion, okay? Yeah. And I found that you don't, you can watch people get disturbed when certain things come up when the teacher is teaching. You can see where some people will get very disturbed about this. And let me say that the reason the Brahma Vihara booklet was written uh, for this Brahma Vihara for everybody was written, that, that booklet that we're putting together now, the reason that was done was so we could present it to absolutely everybody. So we tried to only, only Brahma Vihara, I think is the only Pali word in the whole thing. We took everything away otherwise. And, but in the back of the book, we wanted to put, we were talking about doing another edition. So we had the set of words that you will hear. If you go to any Buddhist temple, you're gonna run into a certain set of words and we want you to have those words, but not because we want you to be Buddhist only because if you wanna to go to a Buddhist temple, you're gonna hear these, you're gonna understand what they're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is very interesting because the Bra Brahma Viharas were a teaching that were around, you know, before the Buddha. And there's a very interesting uh, sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya, which, which is, you know, some monks going to an, another group, another sect, because they, they were going to go on arms round, and it was too early. So they went and had a discussion. And, and this other sect said, look, you know, we understand the teaching of the Buddha is X, Y, Z. It's the Brahma Viharas and working with the hindrances. Uh, but we also teach the Brahma Viharas and working with the hindrances. What is the difference? Yeah. In, and, th and they didn't reply, but they went to the Buddha afterwards and asked him. And he said, well, what you need to include for it to be our teaching, or, or what I teach, as the Buddha said, is you, you need to couple the Brahma Viharas with the factors of enlightenment. Well, and that's that fair. Putting yeah. it with the factors of enlightenment is perfectly fair because it's yeah. part of the training of the meditation. We certainly include the factors of enlightenment. But and, if you were, yeah. And but that's if, what, but if, he, if he said to you that you have to also teach the wheel and getting off the wheel, I would object. No, no. Okay? What that's where I would object. But, but saying, bringing in um, the, um, the enlightenment factors, and certainly you can teach even the Eightfold Path, you can teach it because it aligns with the commandments and it aligns with the virtue and morality training with most religions. It is not contradictory, it is universal. The only place where it goes off with the other religions have a reliance on a, uh, a, a superior being solving the problem and where the Buddhists are different, <laughs> we are personally responsible for steering the ship. We are personally responsible for everything that's going on. Whereas they, I could before wait. I, I, there's nothing wrong with what they're saying. And if they wanted to do that, it certainly is comforting. And I can still see, I don't use this anymore, but when I was in training for a long time, if I was, oh, wow, in a cave and I didn't like it and it was dark and I didn't know what was in the cave, I would feel real good if I believed somebody was there with me, <laughs> let me put it that way to you, okay? Mm -hmm. Or that I had to face uh, being trapped in a situation where I had to get out, I, instead of waiting and, and waiting for somebody to come and take me out of there, I would have to do everything in my power to get out of there, you see? So yeah. in this respect, this is the place where Buddha, the Buddha, Buddhism is different. And when I was teaching, uh, the Christians, I knew this when I walked in the door and saw their faces. They'd never seen a nun before or a monk, and some of them were terrorized. So the first night we did the commandments and the Eightfold Path. And we basically, they understood that we teach the Ten Commandments. We don't teach the first one. That's the first, the first thou shalt not worship any other God before me. We don't do that because we're not using that as part of the help. What, but all the other commandments are in balance for our morality in Buddhism. You can line them all up when you break down our five, they break down into nine pieces. And when you, when you do that, you can show that we're teaching the same line of behavior and living and morality and virtue 
as you are doing. But now we're going to go into how does this all work? It's a science of mind. This is the science reality. And people used to get mad if we called Buddhism science. But look, I mean, now you can't avoid cognitive psychology and neurocognitive science. You cannot toss them out. And what they're doing in this research is confirming everything the Buddha was teaching. So it makes it very real for everybody everywhere. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. Um, but when we come on to dispassion and disenchantment, that has a very clear um, link with coming off the wheel, um, you know, how would you present dispassion and disenchantment, which wasn't in the context of coming off the wheel? It's just the effect of what happens with the mind if you continue to let go. You're looking at where the brain goes. And when you're dealing with this disenchantment and the, this passion, there are cases outside of Buddhism where this happens, okay? So for instance, they use this in military training, they have this kind of thing, disenchantment and dispassion to something so that you stay in a position of full clear control without any effect about anything, you're able to stay completely. What is dispassion? Dispassionate to the past, dispassionate to the future, but attentive to the present time. And even in the case of teaching nothingness, you remember what I showed you as far as the verses were concerned uh, is e the last verses of the um, the Mahachula, Mahachula Sunyata Sutta in the last page is when he saw that he was void of this and void of that and void of this and void of that. He never did get to emptiness, did he? He got the Buddha was not teaching emptiness. He was teaching even though I'm void of this and void of that and void of this and void of that, then he knows this is present. And that's the end of the sutta. If he was teaching emptiness in the terms of Nargajuna teaching emptiness, he would have gone a different way, but he explains it to Ananda in this fashion. So he's saying there's always something present. The absence is present. It's like saying when you were reaching um, what is it called? Um, it escapes my mind. But even that, whatever it is, is something. It's there. And it's an indicator of the emptiness is something. You see? They have had a heck of a time at MIT in the last 20 years, let me tell you. <laughs> when I grew up, you know, space was empty and it was a vacuum. And then they went to no, it's not empty. And then they had to tell somebody what was there. And they said something intelligent. I love that. Something intelligent. Now we, I got to the point philosophically now, what does it mean to say intelligent? See, let me, I, I had, well, we could talk about yesterday. I had somebody actually tell me who was 27 years old that I shouldn't stay and teach the group of poorer people. I should go to the temple for the big celebration, but I wanted to teach these other people. There was two, 300 of them sitting there and they had not heard anything about the Buddha. So they let me teach them. But when I said I was gonna teach them, this person said to me, well, you shouldn't bother teaching them. They're too dumb. They can't understand. And I looked him in the eye and I said, okay, here's the deal. If you are going to be working with me and translating, you need to never, ever, ever say again to me, these people are dumb or they are stupid because dumb means stupid. Oh, we didn't say stupid. I said dumb means stupid and they are not stupid. They are deprived. They are, have been deprived of knowledge so that they could learn something and become what appears to you to be intelligent. You see, they can learn. They're dying to learn, literally. They want to learn. But people are allowing this to happen. And our blessed government here, and I'm sorry, this is real, have named them the backwards people. You see, so people coming from another, let's go see where the backward people live. Wow, that's special, isn't it? 
They came to your neighborhood because they wanted to see them back with people. Do you see the damage, psychological damage? They should be sued for choosing that name for the people instead of economically, de de uh, uh, economically oppressed or economically um, depressed. One of those terms, that was the other choice of what they could choose. But by calling them backward people, for heaven's sakes, what is this, a tourist attraction or something? Now you have teenagers and 20-year-olds going around saying, these people are too dumb to speak. I want to grow up and go to some other country. That's just, just look what's happened. That's just so sad. I mean, I had five kids. What would I tell them if, I, if we were from the backward people? <laughs> Go to school, do the best you can, come home and you know, sweep the yard. <laughs> what, am I, what impression are we doing here? Yeah. So I, I go out on a limb with that. You can leave it in the tape, okay, when it's recorded if you want to, or you can pull it out. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, so can I go to Sarma for a second? Yeah. Okay, Sarma, yeah? Yes, oh, yeah, allow me for one minute. Yeah. When you are, when, 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 when we are perfect in our precepts eh, and by following the six hour process, mm. you will be entering your jhana and you will be progressing on your own. That is one path. Next. If at all you are not cleared with the dispassion, disenchantment, and other things, you will not get Nibbana also. Slowly, it is a natural process. Once the personality develops, then we can think about that the dispassion, disenchantment. In you Hinduism, don't, you don't there are a lot think about of. It. Yeah, that's good to say it that way, but if you're saying it this way, it's as if you think that it happens outside the practice and it's a natural development. The nibbida is, is natural. A natural development, it comes, yeah. it comes, it comes, it comes. Once it's you clear the thing. dispassion, disenchantment, you will not get the nibbana. That is speaking about them in the beginning itself, it will create yeah. a okay. confusion Watch. among the beginners. Yeah. Watch a minute. Okay. You can, you, you can experience the dispassionate briefly and fall into cessation, and that's the first time. Each time it occurs, this dispassion gets stronger and stronger. It's up to you how many times you go through. This is what I'm trying to explain. You have control about how far you're going to go. If you went so far as to impress the brain totally in dispassion, that's you know, the reason you have to why understand. Nine levels of, nine levels of experiences, that is nine levels of chanas are there. That's they right. will take care of it. They will take care of it. It all develops in its own, own time. That's right. But it isn't something to be, I'm trying to say it isn't something to be afraid of. And what it's really uh, about is it is. This is um, out of practice I'm speaking. That's all, nothing else. That's right. It's out of practice and how much you practice and how much you use it. And it comes. We need not worry about the dispassion, dissent, enchantment. If you are taking it's, it as a separate subject, you are serious about something and you are getting craving. Yeah. The thing is, it, it, this passion is developing the same way equanimity starts out as, you know, stillness or calm, and then it gets stronger and it gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger as it goes along. That happens with all of those, with the... Um, in disenchantment gets stronger and stronger, or the dispassion gets stronger and stronger. But the whole thing is, it's a natural development, and it's not going to be that disturbing. I think the only place I've seen it get disturbing, and I was going to mention this, is if you're married, if you're married and you grow into dispassion, a lot of people have a drop in sexual drive, okay? They don't, are not interested in having this in the marriage. There's a, there's a catch there. You know, you have to deal with working this out for yourselves. If the wife is working towards this also, it comes out pretty balanced, okay? But like uh, Damadina and her husband, for instance, in, this, in the text, they're both um, working on all of this. But if you're not, it can get pretty imbalanced. Wait a second. And um, so there was something that... Um, Delson recorded something in reference to this in one of his descriptions of his training, and I have that recording 
And if you listen to that recording, the way his teachers told him to handle this situation is brilliant. It's so well stated and so well explained in everything that this is something I want my students to listen to. But also when you're in a marriage and you decide to pursue the practice that far, okay? You're actually wait, forgetting- I will, add, I will add one minute. Yeah, but wait a minute, you have to forget. You can't forget you're married to this person in marriage and you can't be dispassionate, or how do you call it? You, you have to be compassionate to each other in the marriage. So if the other person isn't practicing meditation, it's not a good idea to go hard and hot and heavy and do this in the deepest, strongest way and spoil the relationship. And it's almost a state of cruelty to the other person, whether it's a man to a woman or a woman to a man. I don't care the situation. Both situations come up. Go ahead. I will add one say? single sentence. I will add one single sentence. Yeah. When you're doing your jhanas, the beauty of Twim is you will be improving your mindfulness. That is one of the seven factors of uh, enlightenment. Correct. When you are, please, please allow me for one minute. If you are yeah. improving your mindfulness, automatically the energy levels, five faculties, uh, the energy improves. When the energy improves, you will be sitting for more time on its own. It is all happening naturally. And when the advanced jhanas are coming, you will be balancing from fourth jhana onwards, remaining factors also on its own, naturally. Right. When these things are happening, the next final state, Nibbana, you need not worry. It will happen on its own. That's the dispassion, disenchantment, everything will take will be taken care of by them. The yeah. first thing we have to remember is precepts. Precepts is more. That is that is why Bhante that, speaks that precepts only. Precepts, what you need to and remember about. Process. Yeah, you remember about your precepts, and I probably skipped them this time. I have completed. You have your five precepts compose an umbrella, and the five hindrances are trying to attack through the umbrella. If you keep if you keep the uh, practice of the precepts, then these can't get through the umbrella. It's like an umbrella, and that's what the precepts are. And the, the, the hindrances are attacking this and bouncing off if you're keeping the precepts. But if you're not keeping the precepts, you break them. You don't forgive yourself. You don't reset it up again. You get a, an umbrella with a bunch of holes in it, and then the, the, the hindrances attack you. This type but you of have protection. To practice this, the six Rs. This type of protection is missing in the other sex. And that is the <laughs> beauty of the PIM. On its own, the natural way, when you take care of precepts and six R process, automatically, right. as explained in the Nibbana, yeah. the path to Nibbana. Yeah, that's right. In our time, it will happen. Yeah, there's too he much. You mentioned timings also. There's you mentioned much... timings of the chart is yes. there. It yes. will happen within one and a half hours or something. Nibbana. Provided yes. everything is perfect in our precepts and six hour process. That's right. So they had an interview. Part. Okay, that is had... absent in the other sex. They think that each is each each item, like your uh, advanced jhanas and uh, Anish spoke yeah. about. Uh, uh, That's right. uh, chanda, chanda, what is that? Uh, oh, craving so, and jhanas and yes. your disenchantment and advanced things, all these things, when you take it as a separate subject, you are serious about it and you will be unnecessarily inviting the craving yeah. <laughs> and, and you will be stuck is, up it this... somewhere, somewhere without your right. knowledge. But here, beginning, Bhante speaks uh, in the first day itself. You wipe out all your jhana, whatever you have done. You, in a in a fresh environment, you sit and you follow my instructions. He says, "That's correct." Please, that's and all. That, I will not speak at all. Hmm. Yeah, and what he's saying about following our instructions precisely to do what we're asking you to do, you can go to Majima Nikaya number seventy-two, section eighteen, and read why it is you're not supposed to mix up with another teacher, another practice, another pattern of everything and try to do twin, it won't work. And you're right, it doesn't work. 
That's why we ask you to work with the Brahma Viharas instead of the breathing so you don't get mixed up because you take the learning, the Brahma Viharas, the way we're teaching it. They were here before, by the way, but they didn't go where these go. They didn't go all the way through. That's the thing you have to remember. They are different because of the way they were being practiced was different. Okay, let's go to Hugh. He has one more question, I think, right? No, you're, you're okay? Okay. Um, are, okay, are you awake now? Can I call you after this meeting? Because I need to talk to you. Okay, all right. So I, is everybody happy? All right. Is everybody happy? Good. <laughs> They keep smiling, okay? So this was a good class. We had some good questions. If you have questions you want to send them in, you can send them to me. It's Kanti Kema 2. Kanti Kema is K-H-A-N-T-I-K-H-E-M-A. Number two at gmail.com. Is send your questions in. I like to get questions because it's what trains me. That's how I was trained. Hundreds of people sent questions and I had to answer the questions if I didn't know the answers. I went to ask Bunty. Sometimes I would turn a question over to him because it was obscure and I needed him to answer. And now he decided that I don't need to call him anymore, you know, because that's where we got in this, because I used to call him to ask a question while I was in, in another country, and he would say, what's the answer? And I would say what it is I thought, and he would say, well, then why are you calling me? <laughs> You've got the answers. So, call, you know, that, but asking me questions is how forcing me to get you the answers and and uh, looking up what I need to to support it. That's what I like to do because that trains me more deeply too. So we have a, we have a mutual supportive agreement here, <laughs> okay? Thank you. And, and I wanna say thank you to everybody for coming. Please also keep sending Meta please to Bhante. Try to do it a little bit each day. He really needs our prayers and he needs support because he's having a rough time. So please send him metta, okay? Thank you. All right. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we are thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, the devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, sister. See you next time. I will be here about two weeks now. I, I just heard today and I'll be flying over. It will be in Gdansk in, and it will be both Poland. So um, I will be still be teaching you from there. And we seem to have a good place to stay. We just found out. So I will still be with you and I'm sure you'll be with me. All right. Have a good one. Bye bye.